Good evening, friends. Uh, I welcome you uh, to our next uh, episode of Expert Opinion. Uh, I'm Chris, and I'm one of the pastors here um, at the Journey Church, and I am looking forward to um, our conversation uh, with our own uh, Mayor uh, Papenfus, uh, who has been serving faithfully in the city of Harrisburg uh, for the past number of years. For those who are tuning in for the first time, uh, Expert Opinion is simply a conversation series that we've been having uh, since the beginning of the coronavirus. Uh, wanting to engage with local leaders and uh, different pastors and theologians from the nation, but also just uh, local uh, leaders, uh, wanting just to have some conversation uh, with them um, as a congregation. Uh, like in previous weeks, uh, we'll have um, a dialogue between the mayor and I for the, maybe the next 30, 45 minutes. Uh, and then if you have any questions that you would like to ask, um, I will try my best to field those uh, towards the end. Uh, but Mayor, um, I appreciate you uh, joining us for our next episode of Expert Opinion. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Sure. So Mayor, you have been uh, the mayor of Harrisburg since January 6, 2014. And uh, you uh, own uh, and lead uh, a wonderful Midtown Scholar in the city. So you've been a local resident for, for so many years. I would love for you just to introduce yourself uh, to those who may or may not know you. Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, um, I actually grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. I was the son of a, a, a state archivist and a reading teacher. Huh. Um, I uh, went to graduate school expecting to become a teacher. And actually, when I first moved to Harrisburg, I taught public school at Central Dauphin. Uh, mm -hmm. And I taught seventh and eighth grade. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, and it really helped root me in the community. Um, but I've always had an entrepreneurial uh, streak. And one of the things that I noticed when we came to Harrisburg is that there wasn't a, a local bookstore. There, and uh, Harrisburg has a long and distinguished tradition of uh, bookstores and presses and all sorts of interesting things, but the, it wasn't there in the late 90s. And uh, we decided we'd fill that void. And my wife and I created uh, basically from scratch a family business. And one of the nice things about Harrisburg is there was uh, uh, lots of uh, property uh, values and, and still to this day are relatively inexpensive. The cost of living is relatively inexpensive. Regionally, we're close to all the great metropolitan uh, centers of the, of the East Coast, and it just seemed like a great location. Mm -hmm. And our, our mission from the beginning was to establish a place where people would come together and engage in the important ideas of the day, mm -hmm. uh, a true third space, so to speak. And this mm -hmm. is before some of the coffee shops. There, there weren't a lot of places where people came together at, at that time. Um, there are more, more now, and, and that's one of the positive things that I've seen in terms of changes in the community. Um, but we wanted to foster civ civic engagement. We held a lot of uh, interesting early forums on politics and uh, mm -hmm. education and, and in addition to, to book talks. That got me uh, really connected to the community and energized politically, activated politically. And when Harrisburg faced a uh, sort of unprecedented crisis of uh, nearing bankruptcy and uh, receivership, uh, I felt uh, like I wanted to uh, try and make a difference and help. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, got me to uh, go into the political realm, something I never would have anticipated. Wow. And that happened back in 2013. Wow. Um, and I have been mayor now, I guess, for the last six six plus years, and we've uh, we've accomplished quite a lot in terms of bringing the the city back to uh, a financially stable position and beginning to slowly uh, grow things and uh, reinvest in uh, in the community and all sorts of different projects. And we can talk about it, but that that's the history and where I've come from. And uh, it is uh, it is it, it, this uh, this current job, and and all that's going on is uh, is 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 an awful lot. It's almost unimaginable where we are today compared to where we were just uh, just a few weeks ago, right. and uh, it's uh, it, it it it's constantly changing, constantly challenging, and uh, it keeps me busy for sure. Hmm. Well, I, I want to make sure to thank you uh, for tuning in and being open. It has been even, as we shared before, uh, an incredibly busy 72 hours for you and even the last couple of weeks. So yeah. thanks for carving out some of your precious time just to have sure. some dialogue with us. Now, I would love to know before I, I want to kind of engage in some conversation around uh, the coronavirus, but even specifically about the last couple of weeks. But I would love to hear mm -hmm. what over the last six years um, as mayor, uh, what would you say are some significant changes that you've experienced here um, and, and maybe some of its continued needs um, as a city? Yeah. 
Well, uh, I think uh, uh, basically rebuilding the city staff and city departments after they had sort of been decimated mm -hmm. by receivership was a large part of what we did. There was when I took office, it looked like our public works department was going to be privatized. There had been a, uh, a move under receivership to do just that and outsource uh, not only sanitation, but a lot of city services. Uh, we, uh, we were able to sort of stop that and then rebuild it. And actually mm -hmm. now we're providing uh, city services for neighboring municipalities like Steel, yeah, which, is, right. uh, which is quite a transformation. Uh, we've been able to slowly uh, grow a, a community policing unit among our police, build back the fire department, whose numbers were completely decimated. Uh, it was so bad in the fire department when I took office that uh, the, the amount of overtime was over a million dollars a year just because there were so few firefighters. Everyone had to work literally around the clock. Wow. Um, and, you know, we've, we, we've sort of done that. Uh, I would say... Um, from a civic engagement uh, standpoint, I think the, the community was still uh, relatively traumatized from, uh, from, the, the, from, from the Reed years, mm -hmm. which, uh, like it or not, had not encouraged a sort of uh, grassroots community-based type of uh, uh, civic engagement towards change. And so there was a lot that had to be, uh, be rebuilt and, and trust that had to be developed. And uh, all of that is still ongoing. And you, you, you see that uh, very much currently today when we're talking about um, how do we bring about systemic change and how do we engage local leaders in a way that uh, uh, policy reflects the, the will of the, uh, of the public. Well, historically in Harrisburg, there was a lot of corruption. There was also uh, not a lot of concern for, for the will of the public uh, or, and, and information was not always shared. One of the things I, I resolved to do very early on was that I was going to go to every single city council meeting, every single committee meeting. I was going to try and uh, be sort of ever present in, present in the workings of government in a way that I thought would help uh, build relationships and, and pay dividends in the long term. And we, we've definitely built trust, I think, between the governing body, which is city council and the mayor's office in a general sense. When I took office, you had various portions of the city suing each other, right? You had uh, uh, the, you know, the treasurer and the uh, city council and the mayor all engaged in lawsuits going back and forth. And uh, it, it, was, it was a mess. It was a dysfunctional, dysfunctional government. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm proud of that. And I'm proud of the fact that uh, we've, we've uh, brought a, a sort of, uh, you know, un, unparalleled, untarnished record of, of, of ethics back uh, mm -hmm. to, to city hall. And um, you know, uh, that is, uh, that, you know, that's some of, some of the stories, so to speak. Yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, and that's good to know. So thanks. Uh, so apparently yeah. your, your willingness to go to all of the like, city council meetings and, and the committee meetings yeah. uh, and being present in the city. I mean, there have been numerous places I have been and you were there as well, wanting to be a faithful kind of present, uh, kind of governor, or, or excuse me, mayor, uh, over yeah. kind of in the kind of a governing sense. And, and I would love to know specifically, it has been, I think, even for, for all people in the globe, but even those uh, in our own country and city, it's been a kind of intense couple of months living through mm -hmm. kind of a global pandemic. And then now oh. even just the significance of um, uh, with like deaths of like George Floyd around the nation and protests and riots. And, and it's, been, it's, been, it's been a full couple of months. And we've been saying here at The Journey, like we're just wanting to be in solidarity with kind of all of the pain and kind of the chaos of the last couple of months. But I would love to know from you, Mayor, how have you understood COVID uh, and how has our city um, been affected and responded in the midst of, of a global pandemic? Yes. So, I mean, if we go back a couple months ago to the, to the start of this pandemic, uh, it was uh, it, it it has been it has been devastating in the sense that uh, it it is impacted uh, every business in the city, um, it, just the way we conduct our lives, um, and uh, there was an awful lot of uncertainty, uh, at least at first, about where we were going. Will we make it through this? What was going to happen? Um, uh, and that was after a period, uh, you, you you might say, on the on the national level, that where there was a lot of denial. Um, and then, um, and then there was a recognition, but it was almost uh, too late at that point. Um, I don't want to get political about the, but the whole thing. But the challenge from a, a local government was how do we continue to provide services yeah. while uh, keeping our own employees safe? And mm -hmm. um, and 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 that that has been uh, that has been a very difficult thing. So uh, throughout the whole pandemic, uh, 
our public works team has been there. They're essential workers. They've been picking up everyone's trash. They have been um, uh, mowing the, the, the grass uh, so that people could go out and exercise safely. Uh, our police have been uh, out and about. Our firefighters have fought fires and um, and responded to 911 calls. And, uh, you know, right right at the beginning, uh, you, you get a call for service. Somebody needs uh, life-saving care or medical attention. And of course, you're going to be there because that's what you do as uh, as public servants. But um, but but there's there was risk uh, to the uh, risk that we'd never seen before in terms of the transmission of COVID. So uh, we shut down City Hall, but we kept essential operations going. Uh, we continued to process bills. We did uh, we implemented telecommuting, just like most households and businesses adapt. The the city adapted, yeah. but we had hundreds. You know, I had hundreds of employees, all of whom's safety was paramount to. Um, to, to my concerns, and and yet they had to continue working. Um, so that was the the first big issue, and we've we've handled that pretty uh, pretty well. It's remarkable. I mean, we haven't had a single sanitation worker or a single firefighter conduct uh, 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 basically get the get COVID nineteen. Uh, we've had a couple of police officers, but uh, it's been handled. They've they've been home. They've recovered, um, and uh, and and basically we've we've we instituted a lot of policies to make sure that it wouldn't spread. Whether it was isolation or, or uh, temperature checks and and uh, having making sure that we had the right uh, protective gear even amidst a sort of national shortage, all of that was was at the center. Okay. Then we had to uh, after after I you know focusing on the welfare health and welfare of of our employees as well as the the overall health and welfare of the community, we had to realize that um, we had gotten ourselves in a position where we were finally economically self-sufficient and balanced and back. We were actually uh, chugging along. If you look at the, the revenues and the receipts of the first two months of the year, they were even exceeding expectations. Wow. Unemployment was incredibly low um, and the, the economy was really moving. Lots of projects were, were planned and then boom, everything stops. Yeah. And, uh, and you have every single mm. business in the city of Harrisburg with uh, you know, essentially forced to close, no tax revenue coming in, no hotel revenue, no amusement tax, none of you know uh, uh, limits on uh, earned income, and 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 no parking revenues. All right. the things that we look to to balance our budget to yeah. pay these essential workers, right? Because the majority of the city budget is the sanitation workers, the police, and the fire. That's what it is. That's what you pay for. So now we were concerned that that we weren't even going to have the revenues to be able to pay for um, for these folks that were working like never before, putting their lives in line like never before in the midst of this mm -hmm. pandemic. So the combination of, of both of those, incredibly stressful, lots of worry and concern for the future. Um, uh, but, but we came together as a community and we did some really remarkable, remarkable things. So just from the city's perspective, uh, we had our, our community policing team out there, uh, led by Blake Lynch, uh, uh, feeding uh, the population of Harrisburg. Um, we partnered with the school district to put remote learning on Channel 20 on our our, our our television station here at the city, really with a moment's, you know, no moment's notice with original content filmed. I mean, just, a, just an incredible thing because we realized, um, and the school district surveyed very early on. We, we weren't going to be able to reach everyone unless we utilize television because of the, the lack of access to, to, to the internet, which is, which is, which is real. Yeah. Um, but that partnership has been, has been, uh, was strengthened like never, never before. And has been, been great. We, we worked with, um, a variety of, uh, local nonprofits, including Impact Harrisburg, to see if we could deploy resources and money right away to businesses that were struggling. Great. And in Harrisburg, we established a, a fund for businesses that were impacted by COVID mm -hmm. to, to get them a, a little bit of cash to be able to make it through uh, right away that was really a model for, for other communities and other municipalities. We had all over the country, people were saying, what's going on in Harrisburg? Can you tell us about, send us uh, your policy. So that's just a you know a, in a nutshell some of the things that yeah. that uh, that that challenged us like never before in just in the last couple of months. That's excellent, uh, and and I I remember reading along the last couple of months hearing things like Impact Harrisburg and uh, the unique ways in which that you were partnering with just other kind of organizations and leaders in our city wanting to help 
all of us, and particularly those who are most vulnerable as a, a businesses or nonprofits survive in the midst of the season. I, I would love to hear um, as well, Mayor, um, now I, you're doing some fun creative stuff this summer, right? And and mm -hmm. I, I live downtown. Uh, and so even just last night was kind of something fun and creative having uh, kind of the, the city row or the restaurant row kind of open. So I would love to hear like, what are some creative ways because it has been a long couple of months uh, and, and there's still a le level of uncertainty um, sure. around this global pandemic. Kind of what are some of the things that the city is continuing to do um, over the next couple of months? Yeah, so um, uh, with regard to COVID-19, and I think it's important and we really can't talk about it enough. Um, it's true that it doesn't spread uh, as easily out of doors as it outdoors as it does in, in, in interior confined spaces. Um, it's true that, um, uh, that the amount of people that are testing positive is declining, but we are not, not at all through the woods. The, um, the, the virus is still out there. And the real, real problem is that uh, um, the majority of people that have the virus don't even know they have it. Mm -hmm. They're asymptomatic. And it's incredibly easy uh, to spread if people don't take proper precautions like wearing a mask, um, washing your hands, uh, social distancing. That's why these things are there. And even though it's summertime and it's sunny and everybody wants to be outside, um, we need to keep that in mind. Also, if you if you actually look at, we, we, we've, we did something very uh, special in Harrisburg too, but the only municipality, York didn't do it, Lancaster didn't do it, in central Pennsylvania, that um, has been testing its wastewater yeah. to, uh, to sort of get a barometer on uh, whether or not the amount of virus in the community was going up we're going down, uh, and we, uh, we 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 utilized, uh, it's called wastewater epidemiology to sort of measure and project the number of people that uh, that have the virus. And we have not, um, the, the testing lags a little bit behind. It lags a couple weeks behind, so we don't know where we are now. But uh, when, when last we checked, at the very time that we were going from red to uh, yellow, um, actually the amount of uh, cases in the community was, was increasing. And again, wow. with all the asymptomatic uh, uh, folks that have it, uh, it can be. It's estimated that as many as one in twenty people have the virus, and mm -hmm. uh, and and that is not reflected in the testing because the people who are being tested usually are the ones that are symptomatic in some mm -hmm. in some manner. So um, the, we're going to continue to utilize the the wastewater testing to let us know. It will also become predictive in the sense that it should be able to show us as we move into the fall, whether or not it's coming back, maybe even before uh, the, the UPMC can tell us that because uh, because of the number of people that are asymptomatic and have it. Mm -hmm. Now, that was a, 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 um, a sort of a serious way to, to say that we're not through the woods. That said, I do support uh, the, the effort to responsibly um, uh, reopen and get back to, uh, you know, some sense of normalcy. People need it. It's been months. And last night, uh, we, again, I think we're sort of a pioneer as a city in shutting down a lot of our streets, partnering with many restaurants that have been closed for months and encouraging people to come on out and, uh, dine and dine safely. And it was really, uh, I went to all the restaurants, uh, yesterday, uh, got a chance to, to see sort of how they were utilizing this space. And this was the first time uh, scores and scores of Harrisburg residents and and friends had been been out uh, yeah. really at all in right. uh, in months and they were dining and uh, it was there was a sense of hope and optimism that maybe we turn the corner and we're moving forward and everybody I think acted incredibly responsibly mm -hmm. and and it was it was well planned and organized but it took that partnership between the city which is really doing the sort of traffic control and the marketing and then the restaurants themselves that were doing all the work and making the reservations and you know laying out the tables and it yeah. was it was it was great to see and um, uh, that is something that we started thinking about actually a couple months ago when we were in the midst of the uh, pandemic how could we how could we get to a reopening stage yeah. and I will admit I think it uh, we we moved more quickly than a lot of people thought right there at the end it was looking like it was going to be a long time <laughs> into yellow and then a long yeah. time towards green and it it rapidly things rapidly got better as the summer has has occurred and 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 we were but we were ready with the plan uh, and I think it's going to be a great thing so that's every Saturday in mm -hmm. June moving forward uh, I got asked a lot last night well 
can it be every day or why are why only Saturdays and can we do it all summer and maybe we you know maybe we can do it all summer let's uh let's see how it goes we're we're, we're trying to uh, go slowly and responsibly and uh but it was it was a huge success uh and uh, uh I'll note that from a city standpoint the 4th of July is also a Saturday so we are heading up to that and uh, uh, we'll be having fireworks this year and people can be outdoors and, and spread out and hopefully enjoy it. That's We've had to cut back on other aspects of city planning, like we're not opening the pools this year. Um, we're not doing some of our, our group activities that we were doing, but uh, we have we have other alternatives and other other things planned. That, that's wonderful, Mayor, and I appreciate you doing that. I remember, uh, actually, even uh, my wife and I, we went out and had dinner, and it was just this beautiful ability uh, just yeah. to eat out at a restaurant and not just have takeout, but to eat at the restaurant. Uh, yeah. And so thank you for, for that collaboration. And now, speaking of collaboration, there was a great question that was asked. Um, is And I know you've probably been collaboration uh, with, with the governor's office and with the police and even with UPMC. And the question is, where, where can we as city residents find the most accurate information on the virus and, and all that's going on? What, what would you say to that? Yes. Well, definitely the Department of Health's uh, website is a, is, a, is a wonderful source of information, and that's what the city relies on. So the city of Harrisburg doesn't have its own health department. We're not going to be uh, making health decisions that, that you know, sort of run contrary to the Department of Health. We're looking to them for the leadership. And I think the governor and the secretary showed incredible leadership during this, uh, this, this crisis. I mean, I think we were at the forefront of other of other states uh, throughout the country in dealing with it. It was done soberly, responsibly, uh, backed by data. Um, uh, and uh, it's just that the data itself is limited in what it shows. It doesn't tell you everything. Um, and uh, supplementing it with uh, with some of the data like I'm talking about through a partnership with CRW, our, our water company, is, uh, is just another tool. Um, and then in speaking with the, uh, you know, the doctors at, at, at UPMC, um, you know, we were we were very fortunate in that we have had a testing center in the city the whole time. Now, mm -hmm. it, it's not uh, it's not like a drive through or you can't just walk in, but it's open for referral. Um, mm -hmm. It's open for residents of the city. Um, nice. And uh, it has at no point did it or or our hospital in the downtown ever reach the dreaded, you know, full capacity where they were having to turn people away. And uh, of course, a large part of trying to to uh, manage this was so that, that the healthcare system wouldn't get overwhelmed. So in Harrisburg, we were never overwhelmed. And that is a true blessing. And I think that's a result of the of the planning that's gone on. Um, but uh, but in terms of information for, for everyone, still the Department of Health, and then um, the city is providing this new, um, uh, this new data that we've been uh, releasing with CRW. And there's been some good stories about that on Penn Live and elsewhere. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate uh, just that helpful information. Uh, kind of two final questions uh, when we think about mm -hmm. the coronavirus, and, and then we'll move into something that's yep. a little bit more immediate. Kind of number one I would ask is, what what kind of recommendations would you give? So we're, we're a house of worship in the city, uh, and, and I'm thankful to be in kind of in connection with other kind of interfaith leaders. What kind of wisdom would you share with us as we're thinking about ourselves when, when do we come back for in-person worship and what may that look like? And, and as our mayor, I, what, what kind of wisdom would you want to share with us when it relates to that? Yeah. Um, and uh, so can, may I ask you uh, first by way of question? Yeah. So uh, has, have, have you only been worshiping virtually up to this point or have we you have. tried any type of, uh, um, you know, return to in-person? No, so it's all it's all been virtual. It, it's all been virtual. We actually today was the first time that we had kind of an outdoor gathering at one of our pastors' houses, like social distancing outdoors. It was yes, kind of the yes. first step of of kind of leaning into being together again, but but nothing in our building, and we've been doing virtually yeah. only. Well, that would be my advice, uh, which would be um, uh, move outside and and yeah. and start with a transitional period where uh, you're having your services outdoors in nature. I think uh, uh, if there's a desire to utilize city parks or infrastructure for that, we'd be happy to partner with you and other other denominations to do that. Uh, we've got an outdoor pavilion in, in many of our parks, uh, all yeah. sorts of different places where you could do it. Um, it is, uh, 
what you what you don't want is people indoors for a long period of time. So if you mm -hmm. have a an hour long service, even if people are wearing wearing masks, that you know the um, there is a danger that the virus can spread much more easily than if you're outdoors in the sunlight with a with a nice breeze. So if it's practical, which I think it is in the summer, um, go outdoors and then uh, consider going back indoors maybe. Maybe once the data is 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 clearly there, showing even more of a decline than we're showing right now. Uh, maybe that's a few weeks away. Maybe it's uh, a month away, but it's it's probably not now. I think a lot of businesses as well. And and remember, we're not yet in the green phase, although we probably are. You know, trying to get there. Uh, I think a lot of businesses that are able to open. If I can, you know, sort of speak personally, uh, maybe about the bookstore as an example. Um, we. We're able to open, but we don't feel that that would be the responsible thing to do quite yet for our staff as well as our customers, because we want to be a place where people hang out and spend time, not just, you know, sort of pop in and, and leave, but, uh, but, but actually uh, browse and engage. So uh, we're not quite ready for that yet. But we did try this past weekend. We tried a curbside pickup that went very well. We had some outdoor carts. We didn't right. let people inside, but we did things outdoors. So I think the more, and, and that's sort of what the restaurants are doing. And, and the more we move to uh, an outdoor sense of community and commerce, I think the better. And I think that is the transitional step. Mm -hmm. And then at some point in the summer, uh, I think we'll, we can move safely indoors. And then hopefully we won't the a resurgence in the fall. Um, but, uh, but that would be my recommendation if, if you were uh, asking me. Yeah, that's wonderful. And actually some of our team was just thinking about some outdoor worship in the park. And so uh, you, I think I think our office manager will be calling uh, the city uh, tomorrow just to start that. That's yeah. wonderful. I love that. And final question when it relates to the coronavirus is, um, who would you say are the real champions in the midst of the season? Um, you've been able to be in connection with a lot of different folks. Yeah. Who, who are the real people who are just who have just stepped up in the season that you want to celebrate? Oh, there's there there are so many stories. I you know I'll 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 highlight the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank for one, uh, which ramped up its operations like we've never seen before amidst a uh, a real sort of supply chain uh, difficulty and confusion uh, at, at the you know especially at the early stages here. Um, they made sure that uh, there was enough food for all those in need and all those uh, um, uh, that uh, that really rely uh, had to become even more reliant without employment or um, or, or easy access or transportation or any number of things to to the uh, normal um, uh, normal logistical ways in which they would get food. So the food bank, yes, but other uh, really all sorts of other organizations throughout throughout the city adapted and stood up and worked and uh, there, there are many, many different in individuals, but certainly um, certainly the fact that we were able uh, to maintain uh, food distribution is great. We also, um, uh, we weren't over overrun by a, a by homelessness in part because you, you saw UPMC going out and ministering to the homeless. That could have been an area where you had um, you had an outbreak or a, a real uh, easy to spread a disaster. We um, we had a lot of community support for things like outdoor uh, sinks and uh, um, comfort stations and 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 that that was great. So there's a coalition uh, called Cash that really worked together, I think, to uh, uh, you know to reopen the showers at the Y and other types of things. They're they're heroes. Um, yeah. uh, I I think our Sanitation workers are heroes, if I may, uh, you know, sure. as well as our police and fire. But certainly, uh, these guys that, uh, yeah. uh, and they'll tell you that uh, the, the volume of trash has been more than ever before because wow. people are at home and uh, wow. cooking and not going out, and uh, it's uh, so it, it's it's been a lot of uh, a lot of challenges. But those are some of the groups I would name, and there are many, many more for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I just want to thank you to to you, Mayor, and to all of city employees and those who have just stepped up in the season. Um, I think on, from, on behalf of just me I, as a city resident, I'm appreciative um, of all of all of you uh, who have stepped up in the season, who have continued to be a presence uh, in this season. Now, I, I want to shift the conversation uh, yeah. to just the last few weeks. Um, 
from just the, the video that was released early May of Ahmed Arbery uh, to the information about Brianna Taylor, uh, and then even uh, just two Mondays ago, the horrific video of the death, the lynching of George Floyd. Um, I, I would love just even from, from your perspective, Mayor, just to hear how are you responding uh, to the tragic deaths uh, of these unarmed black males and females? It's, uh, it, it, it's been, it's been an enormous, uh, outpouring of, uh, of emotion and anger and frustration. Uh, what we're, what we're seeing now is really nothing new. I, I, I am aware of, of the, uh, you know, the longstanding legacy of slavery and Jim Crow and, um, mm -hmm. institutional racism, which really undergirds the, the foundation of a lot of the disparities that we see in our society to today. Um, you see it in our educational system. You see it in, um, in our economic, the basic economics of, of wealth. Um, mm -hmm. You see it in, um, in, in health disparities with, yeah. with COVID. You, you be, we, we saw it right there um, yeah. as, uh, as those that were, um, you know, least mm -hmm. able to um, afford health care um, be socially distant, you know, we're most prone to the, to the virus and it disproportionately affected African-Americans. So th this is not new. What, what's, uh, what is, is encouraging is the degree to which everybody seems to be now focusing and coming together and wanting to uh, make positive change. And that is reassuring. Uh, mm. And I, I do want to say I feel all of the, the, the protest, everything that's happened in Harrisburg up to this point has yeah. been positive. Yeah, it is. Even even though, you know, there, there were some very uh, small in, in, in the grand scheme of things, um, uh, uh, aspects of violence, it was it, it, it has all been a very, very positive and I think important experience and a good thing for Harrisburg to have gone through. And and we're right in the midst of it. And, and I'm hoping now with all this energy that we can we can turn it into a true dialogue and a true engagement on what we want to see to make things different. Um, I can tell you that when we had our last budget hearing uh, last year and we were discussing the police budget, there wasn't a single member of the public that came out. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I'm sure that's going to change this year. And that's and that's a good thing. Right. And I'm getting questions about line items in the budget and why is this there and what does this pay for that I've never seen before. And uh, you may have seen we just uh, announced a, an initiative called Eight Can't Wait, which is, is was actually a, a challenge from uh, President Obama, who called on mayors throughout the, the country to not not just reform their use of force policies, but actually share them with the public in such a way that we can have a conversation that will hopefully lead not only to reforms, but maybe a mutual understanding of why things are the way they are and, and why things are written and how things can be strengthened and changed. And I'm so excited about that because mm -hmm. that is, that's the sort of daily work of government that oftentimes um, there, there isn't uh, a lot of uh, uh, comment on or a lot of uh, energy for. It's very hard to get people involved. And I don't think that's going to be the case moving forward. And that's a, that's really, really a, a positive thing for Harrisburg and for, for all cities throughout the country. Yeah, I thank you for uh, taking President Obama's challenge, the aid can't wait, uh, and being kind of a forward leader in that in, in our own city. And, and I would love to know um, how... how T tell me from your perspective, um, our own policing in our city, and I have a deep respect for Commissioner Carter uh, and think that the two of you have a, a fantastic working relationship. Um, how, how, how has our policing been in our city and uh, what kind of reforms or specific things do you think that we'll continue to focus on uh, in our city as we think about policing and in and, and our black community? Uh, what, what kind of thoughts do you have around that, Mayor? Yeah, so that's a that's that's a question that we can uh, talk about for for uh, a long time, and it's an important one, and we and I appreciate it. Um, I would say that first of all, the leadership in our police department is the right leadership, and when I uh, when I took office, um, it was uh, it was immediately apparent to me that uh, Commissioner Carter, now Commissioner Carter, was the right person for that job. He, he has an extraordinary sense of empathy and ability to, um, to, to, and I have seen it time and time and time again after, after shooting or tragedy or, or whatever, the, the, his ability to 
um, to, to comfort and to, uh, to talk to members of the community is, is an incredible gift. And uh, there was no question that he should, be, he should be the leader of our police department. We're fortunate. Um, you know, he could have already retired and he has been staying on in this job uh, because he, he cares. He cares very, very much. Now, he sets the tone at the top. And, um, and, and it, it, it absolutely is the case that the rest of the command staff that uh, uh, he has hand selected and I have promoted underneath him also reflect that vision. We've got very, very talented, talented okay. folks. At the same time, it is also the case that um, we have a lot of incredibly young police officers uh, under the age of, say, 25 or, or so, uh, and that we have found it very difficult to recruit officers and retain young officers. Um, and, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the things about, about the current climate is that, uh, you know, it, it, you, do, you do have to worry and wonder if it's going to be able if we're going to be able to turn this into something which would encourage our police force to look more like our community, encourage people in the community to join the police force. Um, one of the things that, you know, uh, uh, bothered me a bit was, you know, if if we are going to focus on, um, on, on basically channeling all of our anger at the police, how are we going to get people to, uh, to, to join this or to, to make this a career or recruit? Because I've heard both at the same time, you know, uh, there we, uh, repeatedly in Harrisburg, people have said we want more police officers of color, we want more police officers from the community. But the reality is, we don't turn any away. Uh, we're so uh, eager for 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 people. We will we will hire you, but we don't get the applications. Wow. Um, and and it is uh, it is just a fact that that I mean, it's a tough job. Uh, there are not that many people that want to want to sign up for it. Now, in addition to the fact that we have uh, we have uh, relatively a young force, and that's another thing, um, we do have to focus on on, on training and mm -hmm. um, and and leadership is important. And there's 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 a there's a whole dynamic where whereby Harrisburg didn't hire police officers in receivership. In receivership, mm -hmm. a lot of the old guard retired and left, and mm -hmm. so you basically have this command team at the top, which is doing everything it can. And then uh, wow. more than more than half of the Harrisburg Police Department has been hired since I've been mayor, just in wow. the last six years. Wow. So, and they're all they're all young and they don't have a lot of experience and they're all dedicated and hardworking and uh, in, in, in my opinion are, are striving every day to do the right thing. But it's, uh, it is definitely a department in, uh, in transition and transformation. Uh, which is all the more reason why we need to have the have the have the sort of right leadership. Uh, so, uh, you know, those are just some of the some of the uh, dynamics at, at at play in Harrisburg. Yeah, I appreciate I, that. I'll, yeah, I could also say, um, you know, I, I've said this on online as people. So the, the latest, uh, or you know, one of the latest uh, discussions online is um, about defunding uh, defunding the police. Yeah. And uh, it, whatever that means, I, and I understand that doesn't mean like necessarily eliminating the, the police department, but I can tell you that every year for the past six years, the residents that have asked uh, and inquired about the police, they want more police officers. Mm -hmm. They don't want less police officers. They don't feel that we have enough police wow. in the city to adequately address crime or wow. adequately, um, adequately do community policing or adequately mm -hmm. make sure that our officers know the community. Because we have so few officers, and uh, you know they're stretched so thin, right, you're sort of running from call to call to call. They can't be as proactive or mm -hmm. as engaged as you might otherwise have. So, on the one hand, with the pressure to fund the police, there's also the pressure to, well, maybe we should fund more training, maybe we should fund more police officers. Maybe it's not, uh, maybe it's not about defunding them. It's about how the money is mm -hmm. utilized. And then I would also say. Um, I understand the uh, the concern that, uh, you, that 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 I'm hearing in the community. Well, you know, uh, uh, why are why can't we have more social workers than police officers, or why can't we have more? And and I would agree completely. But uh, because right now, it, uh, policing has really really changed. If you if you look at the, the 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 average calls that police officers are getting today, a lot of it is 
work that would be better suited for social wow. workers. They, they get called for every type of imaginable thing. Um, and uh, if they could focus on, on, on just the things that require policing and have, uh, you know, mental health and uh, social services and all sorts of other things doing, doing other aspects, that would be great. But uh, that requires investing in, uh, in the whole social, social services end. And if we're going to do that, then uh, that would be wonderful. And the, the people who would welcome it the most would be the police. Um, who don't, who aren't social workers and, and, you know, aren't, aren't, don't, don't have enough training to be able to do that. So I think this conversation and, and all that's coming out of it is, is, uh, is definitely good and very positive. And hopefully it'll, it'll allow us to, uh, to move forward uh, and in, in a way that's really beneficial to the community. Yeah, I think that that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And what I, what I appreciate sure. in particular is, um, like, like you named just a few moments ago that last fall thinking about um, uh, even just the budget uh, for police officers and just how the conversation has changed in just a few months for us in our city. I think that's only helpful to have the conversation sometimes is just half the battle around how can we make sure that our police um, are adequately caring and keeping us safe, but also uh, keeping all people safe. Uh, and, and there's a question that was asked that I, that I want to ask you, Mayor, that I think was really appropriate. And it says, how would you describe community policing and how has it impacted the city and are there plans to increase it? And, and what has been your experience uh, with that? Yeah, so, uh, so we have a dedicated community policing team uh, and uh, it's a mixture of uh, dedicated officers and a civilian community policing coordinator. That's uh, Blake Lynch. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the team that uh, we utilize uh, for a number of different partnerships in the community, including, um, including the work that we do with the school district. Uh, uh, one thing that we were doing before this hit and you know, who knows the current status of next school year, but we were planning to bring SROs, school resource officers, back to the Harrisburg School District in the fall. And that's sort of, I mean, I think that will still happen, but it's on hold at the moment. And it is, uh, but it was, it, was, it was out of the community policing unit. The community policing unit is also the unit that is going to the public meetings and, and neighborhood watch organizations and the, you know, various conversations. It's out there. Its, its job is to build relationships and its focus is on building those relationships and then conveying back to the leadership, uh, to the commissioner and to others, uh, the pulse of the community and, and uh, what the community needs and wants. And uh, again, usually, historically, that has been um, more police if you mm -hmm. ask the average Harrisburg resident, um, not, uh, not less. And, so, and community policing in general means a return to police officers that really are visible and known to their community, you know, the walking the beat concept. And, and, uh, and that is, uh, that is something which requires simply uh, a greater capacity than, than the city has, but we have a dedicated unit and um, talking about how we can expand that and grow that is the plan moving forward. Um, but uh, in general, we, for every year that we've had, this is a fact as well, for every year that we've had a police budget that, that I've managed for the last six years, we have always had more money that we could have spent on uh, police than we, than, we, than we have because we have not been able to hire or get the recruits. So every year we've come under budget significantly uh, just because of the, of the dynamics that are out there. And I think, frankly, it's going to be harder to recruit mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, and, uh, I, I don't, you know, we, the community needs to understand that and be involved in the conversation, but, uh, uh, you know, that is a concern that I have. Yeah, I think that's really fair. And, and I would even say, uh, on, on Wednesday when I was, was at the, the March, uh, with you and, and, yeah. and our other 400 and 500 friends that were yeah. there, um, I, I found, I found that the police in our city were, were kind, uh, and, and I made it a point to every time I saw one as we were walking along the streets, just to say thank you to them. And there was a sense of, um, and, and I could sense, I could sense the culture that Commissioner Carter has set uh, for for our police department. Uh, one in which having collaborative, kind relationships with with citizens uh, is priority. So I, I just want to just want to name that. I, I my experience thus far has been been positive, but but I want to ask you a question yeah. that relates to that. Oh, would you? Feel free if you want to respond. 
I would like to just comment on that for a minute yeah. because uh, if if we go back uh, a week ago to to, to last Saturday and, yeah. and and we just look at protests in general, the role of the Harrisburg police is basically traffic control to protect the protesters and protect the residents of the city. That's that's what it is. That's that's all it is. That's what it's going to be to tomorrow at the the rallies that are going. You know, it, it we 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 put up uh, traffic barricades. We um, we we try and stay in the background, and we give people the right to express themselves. With the capital of Pennsylvania, we get rallies all the time. There's almost always something going on on those capital steps, and it and, and not all of them go out into the streets. But when they do go out in the streets, it can be it can be dangerous. Um, and so this the whole situation that happened on Saturday was uh, basically occurred in part because the police were trying to stop traffic from going down North Street and Front Street. And the, we weren't entirely sure where the protesters were marching to because there hadn't been a, a plan. And then from the protester standpoint, they were suddenly coming upon all these police officers and wondering, why are these police officers here? They didn't really understand they were there to keep them safe or to direct traffic. And the, the whole thing was basically a misunderstanding um, that uh, that then got out of control and um, and then, uh, you know, ended up in in uh, in the sort of extraordinary circumstances that, that, that we got in. But 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 since then and even when when we marched uh, this this past week together, when we marched through the neighborhood, you know, the the. the who do you think was keeping the cars from coming down and hitting the protesters? It was the police. And they were trying to stay a couple blocks respectfully away at all times. And, uh, and they did, I think they were, they were pretty much on the outskirts. Um, they weren't looking for it, but if suddenly we had veered, you know, to a different direction, um, it, it we could have come in conflict with, there could have been a, a you know, a, a, a point of conflict. So, I said early on, one of the great lessons of that first rally was we've got to find who are the organizers because we didn't know uh, last Saturday who they were. And we've got to work with them on march routes and, you know, um, and, and time frames and other things. And we're not going to dictate it. They can say what it is, but they just need to hopefully tell us ahead of time so that we can we can keep everybody safe. But that is what the Harrisburg police is job is. It's not to limit yeah. free speech. It's not to curtail protests. It's to protect yeah. the protesters and protect the public. And, you know, you, we have had situations as well where um, other types of protests have have really inconvenienced the Harrisburg residents. When you had those re, that reopened PA rally, it was uh, it was it was not fair to many people who lived in the city and had to basically put up with uh, noise and um, and all these people, you know, going through their their streets, their their residential streets in the city. So the second time they came back, we sort of blocked those roads off, and we we made sure that um, uh, that it stayed on the main the main capital complex, and it worked much more smoothly. Uh, and these are these are both lessons that we're learning, but they're also things that we we can only do so much. Uh, so, for instance, tomorrow, right. if I may, uh, we have we have reports of. Uh, a number of different uh, organizations, many of whom, um, you know, are, are sort of Second Amendment organizations, gun organizations that want to come and rally in support of the Second Amendment. Um, and but we don't really know where they're going. We haven't uh, identified a leader. Um, the the one that was organized by the uh, uh, the state senator is canceled, but still others are coming. Um, it, you know, and it's in that type of confusion and chaos, and then you add guns to it, where it, you know, it could easily become a powder keg, uh, and um, it it makes the job of policing that that much hard, but I, harder. But I can tell you what the police are doing right now is they're trying to determine where to put the barricades and um, how to stay on the outskirts, how to protect people. That's what they're doing right now, yeah. and uh, that's what they will do um, uh, tomorrow, and hopefully. Um, Hopefully, the you know there won't be a conflict between uh, that goal and the goal of the protesters. Yeah. So, I, what, what kind of wisdom? So, there was a question that I asked that there's a potential that it might be violent, and simply I think violent simply because there are guns and there are people who from two opposing signs descending on our capital steps, which is their right. Uh, but what kind sure. of wisdom? Uh, which you give to those of us who live in the city, those of us who live downtown, uh, in, in kind of preparation for the potential kind of chaos of tomorrow night. 
Yeah, I would ask, yeah, this is me personally, obviously people have the right to do uh, uh, what, they, what they will, but I would ask that if you don't have to go downtown tomorrow uh, morning, don't. Um, and I would also say that uh, 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 nothing good is going to come to, uh, a, you know, come of a, a sort of counter protest to another protest where you, where you bring these two groups together. Um, you know, I, I believe uh, that the best strategy is one to um, let these folks say what they want to say and then have them leave and hopefully leave peacefully and not have that uh, detract or distract from uh, the message that we saw today and that we've seen over the last several days. And then we'll see, to, you know, the day after tomorrow right. and the day after that, because right. that is here to stay. This right. is a distraction. Yes. And there are definitely elements of, uh, of, of, of this distraction that are, are interested in conflict. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I'm not going to get too political on your show, but I feel <laughs> that uh, from the, you know, on the federal side of things, there is yeah. a, a desire to sort of stoke this right. for, frankly, political ends. And we shouldn't play into that. We should not yeah. play into uh, that agenda. And, uh, and you're only playing into it, I think, if you go and you get in conflict with these folks that are coming tomorrow. So let's uh, stay home. That's the message, if you can. And then yeah. when they're gone, we'll go back and we'll have another, uh, we'll have another march and a rally. Uh, but right. we don't have to do it tomorrow at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. or 12. Um, and, and let's hope that maybe there's no story, that it mm -hmm. fizzles out, that yeah. not that many people come. And that, that, you know, I think that will say something. You, you will then be able to contrast that with, right. uh, with the hundreds of people that have come to march for uh, the noble cause of mm -hmm. uh, Black Lives Matter. This is, this is not the time to be, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, trying to have conflict with that and confuse people. And uh, I don't know what, I don't really know what the agenda of, of these groups is tomorrow, but um, the, the agenda is definitely not one of, uh, of, 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 of the Black Lives Matter movement for sure. Right, right. Yeah, and, and one person asked the question, I think, and I think it speaks right into this is, what, what is the kind of current policy if a protest would get out of control? Um, and, and I assume the police are, that's kind of part of their key focus tomorrow, but, 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 but what, what would be the, the, the practice or, or the, uh, the policy of that? Yeah, well, you saw some of that last uh, Saturday, which is that, you know, so the Harrisburg police officers are going to start out in plain, you know, in their normal uniforms, directing traffic, and they are going to be stationed at various checkpoints around the perimeter of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the Capitol Police are going to be focused on the Capitol complex, but they're also going to be, um, you know, uh, a little bit back and not, not uh, as overtly, uh, you know, in, in, in not trying to inflame anything which is, which is going on. Um, but if it gets out of control, um, uh, what happens is, uh, you know, you might call in the state police. Uh, there, there are going to be other agencies that can come in. Um, if there's if there's violence, then uh, then they will come in protective gear or in riot right. gear, as it's commonly known, because they have a responsibility to um, protect the public and to protect property and to protect the Capitol. I mean, that's what the Capitol Police are for. Um, <laughs> it's to protect the Capitol complex. So. <laughs> Um, you know, so uh, that is what would happen. And then and then the state police would be there. And, and there's a lot of agencies. And um, uh, uh, you saw we had we had horses that came in. We had a number of things that came in on uh, 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 Saturday a week ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we ended up with a curfew. And luckily, it, 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 it the, the curfew worked and people went home peacefully. Yeah. But as we've seen throughout the country, that may not be the case. And then then uh, there can be there can be even more conflict. So I'm hoping we don't have to get there. I can tell you that everybody is um, is 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 focused on trying to keep this safe, and and they I think everyone knows how dangerous the situation tomorrow could be. So public, if you're listening, don't go downtown tomorrow morning. That uh, things are supposed to start by ten. We're going to have barricades out early in the morning, probably by like nine, you know, eight nine in the morning. Um, just, just, uh, if, if, if nothing has come of it by lunchtime, you know, that's, that's a good thing and things will go back to normal, but uh, we really don't know who's coming and, you know, what their intent is.
That's good. I, I think I have two final questions for you, okay. Mayor. Yes. Because you, you have been incredible. So thank you. One thank of them you. Is, is, is an audience question. And I think it's a really good question. I appreciate the nuance in it. And is there a way that we can let not only Black Lives Matter, but also police department know that we support them? And we we here at The Journey, like we, we have declared that Black Lives Matter, yes, right? Uh, but we've also declared that police lives matter too, that we're for life. Uh, uh, in a holistic sense, in, in a totality sense. And so, but what would you say to that? Like, how, how can we let our Black Lives brothers and sisters and, and the police know that, that we kind of support and, and that we're for them? Right, well, um, I think that's where uh, helping to facilitate a dialogue uh, comes in and helping uh, like we're having now, but also educating, uh, uh, you know, both sides as to um, the various perspectives. I mean. Uh, I think it, and then hopefully having that, uh, having having everything sort of meet on the field of of policy. So I, I think this is one of the things that attracted me to eight can't wait. I think the more we can focus, um, because I don't think there's anything uh, antithetical about supporting Black Lives Matter and supporting the police. Believe it or not, I don't think you do either. But um, uh, so so the question is practically, how can we? How can we meet on the field of policy and craft policies that are respectful and reflective of both? And if so, we'll do a challenge like eight can't wait, get people involved in that. That is that is something we have just uh, we didn't really discuss it, but we have a general order. A general order is what basically governs uh, uh, how police respond to things and how how they use force if they need to use force. And it's a, a sort of statement. Um, a statement of principle, almost mm -hmm. the gui a guiding document, mm -hmm. and so we should talk about that. And if we want things a little bit different, or changed, or strengthened, or then mm -hmm. uh, that's a that's a great way to effectively, I think, show support for both police and for Black Lives Matter at the same time, mm -hmm. and and maybe helping channel, um, uh, helping giving uh, give people avenues so that they can see that what they're pushing for is making making a difference. Hold, I mean, that means holding people accountable uh, for sure as well and uh, shining a spotlight on what's going on. Um, but uh, you may have seen just this past week, uh, our, our leadership in, in, in Harrisburg uh, uh, terminated a police cadet uh, because it was revealed that the police cadet had made uh, clearly uh, racist uh, comments on social media and um, not disclosed uh, uh, that account to, um, uh, which is something that you're, you're sort of required to do when you're interviewed to become a, a police officer, and uh, and so we have no to no tolerance uh, for mm -hmm. that, uh, and the and but uh, we need to we need to hold everybody needs to be held accountable, and uh, I think I think leaders like yourself can can help make sure that that is happening, and and at the same time, both sides are sort of channeling their energy hopefully into into sort of productive solutions. I appreciate that. And and, and I want to know just on a personal level, like you, you have been stretched over the last 72 hours. It has been a long couple of weeks. And how can we um, just as a church and as a people just be praying and supporting you uh, in this season as our mayor? Well, uh, I, I would welcome uh, your prayers and, and appreciate uh, appreciate that. And it's not just about me as mayor. It's about all of our elected officials and all of our employees. We have hundreds of people that work for the for for, for the city, and we um, we could use your prayers. Um, and it, it's 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 been a it, it has been a very difficult time because uh, first the COVID crisis really sort of redefined how we're working and how we're interacting. And we went into a world in which we were really quite disconnected. I mean, Zoom is wonderful, but uh, it's just not the same as sitting at a table with someone and having a cup of coffee and a conversation. And so uh, emotionally speaking, those human connections, which are so important and so restorative, uh, were, already, um, were already sort of deeply impacted and changed by COVID. And now, uh, uh, you know, we've been in in crisis mode, um, understandably so, uh, and 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 traumatized by what we what we're what we're seeing nationally, and it is it is it is difficult, I think, for everyone. I, I understand the anger, I understand the frustration, I also yeah. understand the sort of the unsatisfying nature of not just Zoom but social media, which really just becomes this means of 
you know, of channeling anger and frustration and I get it, but it, it's not, it ultimately is not satisfying because it's ultimately not um, doing the job of bringing people together for change. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna, we're all in this together. Um, that was the message of COVID. It's also, I think the message of Black Lives Matter. We need to all be in this together, moving towards justice and change. So um, uh, just, just uh, continue praying and continue working towards that end. Well, know, Mayor, that we, we support you uh, and that we will continue to pray for you uh, and your family um, as you continue to lead so faithfully. Um, if, if, you, if, if it's okay with you, there's one final question uh, that I'll yeah. ask and I'll, give a, I'll let you have the final words because I, I just appreciate uh, someone asking, is there any possible options for children in the city this summer um, as they're dealing with COVID and just kind of racist acts? Um, like what, what kind of means are there for, for, for school? That was a, a community question. I want to make sure to ask that. Yeah, I, I look, children have been, um, I would say, severely impacted by, by what's happened over the past several, several months in, in a way that we're, we're not even, I think, fully cognizant of yet. Um, especially how it's affected um, learning and school and um, uh, and socialization. Uh, I mean, we basically went just you know one day we flipped the switch and suddenly everybody was 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 isolated. Um, and now you know uh, I can say I, I have three I had three children. My daughter just graduated from high school, but did she really graduate from high school? I mean, she she uh, we 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 went to a uh, drive-in movie theater and sort of watched it from from the car, and uh, you know, and she's not sure is is college going to start in the fall? Is college not going to start in the fall? Is she going to um, you know uh, you know? And and then my my uh, younger uh, sons, you know, uh, there there's been basically no play time or no socialization time with, 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 their, with their friends. And so um, the question of what are we gonna do with our kids, especially as uh, um, you know, it's warmer and you know, we're, we're moving forward in the summer is, 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 is an important one. That said, um, some of the traditional things that we've done, like that some, the summer programming and the, and the pools and everything, we just can't do. We can't do it safely from a public health standpoint. So, um, so we are, we are really in a, in a tough spot. So my, my message on that would be, um, you know, we have to focus on strengthening families. Uh, one of the, uh, the positives, if you say, uh, you know, from COVID has been that, um, there has been more nuclear family, you know, time with, with, with immediate loved ones. And I think that that is good and we can maybe build on that. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, uh, so the, the, the question of what we're going to do to, to help our youth is, is still something that requires everyone and, and creating wider family networks and wider support networks. Um, you know, we're going to do some things over the summer. We're going to have some movie nights, uh, in the park. We're going to have, we're still going to give lunches, uh, to kids as part of a summer program, but they're going to be, um, they're going to be missing out on activities and experiences, and uh, it's 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 going to be a difficult time. And we've we've just got to we've got to focus on our youth because they are absolutely the future of this city. I think that's right. Well, Mayor Papenfus, thank you uh, for your faithful you. leadership. Uh, for being willing to have a, a conversation with me over, over the past um, hour and know that we are continuing to support and to pray for you um, over the next couple of months that seem like they will continually be uncertain and uh, ever changing. And so so know that you have our support. Any, any final words uh, that you would like to share uh, before we conclude tonight? Well, just, uh, just thank you for, for having me. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to, um, to speak to you. I hope uh, people realize that, um, you know, we're working, everyone is, is working every day. People, uh, people are a little, can be a little bit on edge. Uh, police are people too. Um, you know, protesters are, are exhausted. Everyone is, is exhausted. And we've got to, we, we need, we need our religious institutions in part because of the restorative power of prayer and faith. And um, with, with, without that, uh, physical meaning, uh, uh, the ability to gather together um, in a physical way, uh, it, is, it is very hard to do. So I'm pleased that we're going to see a transition, hopefully now, back to 
um, our, our communities of faith being able to come together again, because that will also serve as a, a real strengthening uh, of, of, of the community and a real restoration of all of us. We need that. We need it very much. That's right. Thank you again. Uh, and, and we will be praying for you over the next couple of days uh, with so much uncertainty. And, and for those who tuned in tonight, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and we will look forward to being together again on Expert Opinion next Sunday um, at six o'clock. And blessings to you, my friends, tonight. Thank you. Yeah.